We are uh, in week two of our Advent series called The Expected One. Uh, I am looking forward to this series. I have been looking forward to this series, but uh, really it's the second week of Advent. As we talked about earlier, as Chris and Ronette were up here lighting the candles, uh, this week is a week that represents the peace that comes with, with Christ, right? that the coming Messiah, who we know as Jesus Christ, would bring. We talk about that peace this morning. And this Advent, what we're doing in our series is we're going back to the Old Testament. Uh, we're looking at some of the prophecies of Jesus. We're looking at some of the things that the Old Testament prophets, specifically Isaiah for most of this, uh, say about Jesus. And then we're looking forward to the New Testament and looking at uh, how, what we know on this side of things. And so we're, we're looking at these prophecies really in two different lenses. The first lens we have is the, the historical lens. Uh, what, was, what was this prophecy spoken into? Uh, where, where were these people? Who was Isaiah speaking to? What is the, what's the context here that Isaiah is talking in? The second lens is the prophetical lens. Uh, what is not only just what was this, but what is this looking forward to? Uh, what, are we, what, is this, what is this predicting? What is this looking forward to? And last week we began the series by looking at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, uh, we saw the context it was written to. It was, a, it was a dark time described by things like fearful gloom and darkness. But into that context, we see the promise of the coming Messiah. Right? We see that uh, he's going to bring light into darkness. We see he's going to bring hope into hopeless, hopelessness. And then today we'll see he brings peace into the chaos that life sometimes brings. But that's, those, that's who Isaiah 9 was written, for, written towards. And these people who were in darkness. And now here's Jesus. He's bringing light into darkness. They were hopeless. But now here's Jesus bringing hope into hopelessness. Right, and last week was essentially this. Last week in Isaiah chapter 9 was a promise that the Messiah was coming. All right, there is going to be a Messiah, and he is coming. And there is hope because the Messiah is coming. He'll be born. He'll be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And it was sealed with Isaiah 9, 7, which says the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Uh, you, you can't have, a, a, like, pinky promises aren't that strong. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you can't have a stronger promise than to say the zeal of the Lord Almighty is going to be what's going to accomplish this. So we have this promise. And this week, we aren't actually moving far from Isaiah 9. In fact, we'll be just a couple chapters over in Isaiah chapter 11. So you can go ahead and turn there with me if you'd like. Uh, if you are in one of our chair Bibles, it'll be on page 326. And we'll just read the first nine verses together. Isaiah chapter 11 starting at verse 1. Here's what we read. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy, destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this is a great passage, and I'm looking forward to unpacking it with you this morning. We'll start the same way we did last week, by looking at the historical lens. All right, what, is, what, is this, where, what is this spoken into? And in reality, you can kind of guess this, we're only two chapters later from what we read last week, so the context is pretty much the same, and that's true. Actually, the context in Isaiah doesn't really change much for the first 37 chapters. 
Right, so between 9 and 11, it doesn't really change much, but we'll go a little bit deeper today than we were able to last week. And so if you'll remember, last week there's this looming threat on the horizon named Assyria. Right, Assyria is, is coming. Uh, they want resources. They want land. They want to take over. They want everything. Right? They want to take over everything, and they don't really care who or what stands in their way. All right, this is, this is what they're doing. And, and so it's kind of like the classic villain situation, honestly, right? It reminds me of sort of a, a mob mentality. Everybody in their way, and in this case, every country that they're coming for has a decision to make. And here's the decision. Are we for or against Assyria? Now, it's one thing to be against Assyria, right? That's, that's one thing. It's probably the right thing to do. For Assyria, that's a different story. Right? Because, like I said, just, just like the mob, even if you make that decision, do you trust them? Are we that desperate? Are we really going to, to, to combine with Assyria here? Are we going to be allies with Assyria? And unfortunately, looking back historically, it didn't really matter which one of those you chose. Assyria was going to do what Assyria was going to do, and no one could stand in their way. Right? That's, just, that's just the way it was. Assyria was going to do what they were going to do. And this is the context in which Isaiah is saying what he's saying here and what he said last week. In chapter 7, Isaiah goes to King Ahaz, not to be confused with King Ahab from our last series talking about Elijah. Ahaz, with a Z, is king over Israel at this point. Elijah goes to him, or sorry, Elijah, no, I said Elijah, that messed me up. Isaiah goes to him, and he basically says, look, don't forge an alliance with Assyria. You can read this in chapter 7. He reminds him that, that God has his back. He reminds him that everything is going to be okay. In fact, part of his speech in Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah 7, 4, is essentially, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid, don't lose heart. Just these reminders that God has him. Essentially, don't worry about all of that. God is going to protect you. But King Ahaz is, is an interesting guy. Uh, he's actually related uh, to King David, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. All right, king Ahaz was one of the more wicked kings that we have in Scripture. Uh, he promoted idol worship. He even offered some of his own kids uh, in child sacrifice to the god Molech. Uh, you can read that story in 2 Chronicles 28 if you're interested. Uh, but this is, this is who he is. He, uh, he, he follows the Baals, the false gods of the time, and so to the surprise of absolutely no one listening to me right now, Ahaz does exactly the opposite of what Isaiah is calling him to do, and he makes an alliance with Assyria. But you see what Isaiah was saying here. Ahaz, don't, don't put your hope in Assyria. Put your hope in the Lord. Put your hope in God. But they put their hope in Assyria. It was false hope, and that's exactly what they got. They got some false hope. Right, Assyria took over in 586 B.C., and if you want to get a sense for what that was like, you can take a book, look at the book of Lamentations. Right, Lamentations starts with this. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. Right, it goes on in, chapter, in verse 7. Her enemies looked at her and laughed at her destruction. So this outcome might have come as a surprise to Ahaz, but it did not come as a surprise to to Isaiah, right? This is actually what God told Isaiah would happen in Isaiah chapter 6. You go back to Isaiah chapter 6, and that, by the way, is one of the most incredible scriptures in all of the Bible, right? Isaiah gets this vision of the throne room of the Lord, and it is a, a beautiful image. But one of the things that happens in that space is that God begins to ask this question, who's going to go? Who, who will we send? And Isaiah has these famous words, here am I, Lord, send me. All right, but what is, he, what is he sending him to? Well, listen to Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 9. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears understand with their hearts and be turned and be in turn and be healed then i said for how long lord and he answered until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant till the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged 
until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. So you read this in Isaiah chapter 6 and, and this, this language at the end, the seed will be a stump. And, and you again, just like last week, the overwhelming sense in the context here is hopelessness. It's hopelessness. It's darkness. It's that fearful gloom that we talked about last week. But you see this imagery of Israel just being this, this forest of stumps. But then you get to our passage for this morning, Isaiah chapter 11, and again, it starts with hope. Yeah. Right? Verse 1 in chapter 11 says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. So we have Israel being a forest of stumps, and Isaiah 11 says the Messiah is going to be coming from one of those stumps. It's not over. There is hope. So you can see from a historical lens, there's, there's hope in this passage in Isaiah chapter 11. What about the prophetical lens? What is this looking forward to? And I think you may know where this is going. This is just like last week. It points directly to the Messiah, who we know on this side of things as Jesus. Right? You get to Matthew chapter 1, and guess who's in the genealogy of Jesus? We have Jesse, the father of David. Right, Isaiah chapter 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Right? You get to the end of the book in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus himself says that he is the root and the offspring of David. He is the bright morning star. Right? But this passage, Isaiah chapter 11, goes a little bit deeper than our passage from last week in Isaiah chapter 9. Right, last week, Isaiah chapter 9 told us that Jesus would be coming. It was, a, it was a promise that the Messiah was going to come. Isaiah chapter 11 goes a step further. It's not just that that the Messiah is going to come, but here are some descriptions of what the life of the Messiah is going to look like. And that's where I want to spend our time this morning. All right, what, is, what is Isaiah chapter 11 telling us about some of the characterizations of Jesus, of the Messiah? What is it going to tell us about how Jesus would live, how the Messiah would live? And so that's what, we're going to, that's what we're going to spend our time this morning. What are some characteristics? What are the marks of the Messiah that we should be looking for? And really... Do they actually look forward to Jesus? Right? Did Jesus fulfill these marks? Do we see these marks in Jesus? So the first mark is this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, is that the, the Messiah will be given the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here's what verse 2 says. <clears throat> it says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Right, he will be given the spirit. It will be a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of, of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And sometimes we like to think that this, this Holy Spirit thing was just an old a New Testament thing. Right, it happened after Jesus left. He sent the Holy Spirit. And that is true. After he left, he did send the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not just a New Testament thing. The Holy Spirit is an Old Testament thing as well. Right? The Holy Spirit would, would come on people and enable them to function in specific ministries. <clears throat> We know that the Holy Spirit was on Saul, right? Because in 1 Samuel 16, 14, the Spirit departs from Saul because of his sin against God. David was anointed king, and the Spirit of the Lord was on him as well. It's interesting. One of the Psalms that we looked at this summer was Psalm 51. It was David's confession of sorts after being called out with his relationship with Bathsheba, right? And in that Psalm, there's kind of this, this over, this overlooked line, and where David is essentially begging that the Holy Spirit would not be taken from him. Amen, amen. Right? We have, it says, don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Amen. So it's not a new thing. It's not a strange thing to hear about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but here's the question. Do we see this played out in the New Testament in Jesus? Mm -hmm. Do we see the Holy Spirit in Jesus? Absolutely. Right? Jesus go, arrives on the scene of the Gospels. As he grows up, he gets older. He goes down to the river to be baptized by John the Baptist. And Scripture says the Spirit descended on him like a dove. Right? Those other characteristics that Isaiah described were there as well. You just look at Luke 2.52. Right? Jesus is playing hooky from his parents. He is in the temple. <clears throat> 
He's listening to the teaching even as a kid. And that section ends with these words in Luke 2, 52. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Right, probably the most famous place, the obvious place where we see this is in Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 14, <clears throat> we read this. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he was not quoting our passage here, but he is quoting Isaiah. That's Isaiah chapter 61 that he is quoting, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is on me. But we see all of these marks that Isaiah says will be in there for the Holy Spirit in Jesus. And just two chapters, that's like the early part of Jesus. We see all of those things. Right? We see wisdom and understanding. We see his counsel and his might. We see the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. These are all fulfilled in Jesus. Every promise from Isaiah 11 about the filling of the Holy Spirit on the Messiah is fulfilled in Jesus. We see that. So here's, here's another characteristic of the Messiah from Isaiah chapter 11. We see that the Messiah is going to be one who, who sees the heart and contends for the weak. Listen to verse three in the first half of verse 3 and, and verse 4. And he will, sorry, verse 3 in the first half of verse 4. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give the decisions for the poor of the earth. Now, this is, this is one of those places where I just don't really like how the NIV translates this. Uh, it translates it accurately, but it doesn't communicate it very well. Does that make sense? You know, it says the right words, but it doesn't communicate as clearly as I like. And I think uh, one of the, the New Living Translation does it pretty well. I want you to just to listen to this version. I don't have it up on the screen. It says, He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. Right. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Amen. This is the spirit of what Isaiah is. The NIV doesn't translate with the spirit of what he's saying. It translates directly what he's saying. Right, but he's going to move for justice. He's going to help the poor. He's going to advocate for the weak. This is the spirit of what Isaiah 11 is saying here. But he's not going to do it on based on what he sees or on what he hears. He's going to do it based on his righteousness. So we, again, we ask this question, do we see this in Jesus? Is Jesus one who sees the heart and contends for the weak? Absolutely. All right, this is what Jesus' ministry was all about. All right, John 7, 24, Jesus is talking to some people who are, who are questioning about him healing on the Sabbath. And he basically, his response is essentially this, stop judging by appearances and judge correctly. <laughs> judge according to righteous judgment. Shades of when King David was anointed king, right? First, first Samuel 16, 7, people look at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. All right, Jesus was constantly seeing through things and making decisions based on people's heart. You see it with a Roman centurion who didn't have all of the qualifications to match up with the Pharisees, but Jesus looks at him and he says, I haven't seen this great faith in all of Israel. All right, you see it as he interacts with people. You see it with the people that he surrounds himself with. You see it with the people that he healed. You see it with the people that he touched when no one else was willing to touch them. You see this all over Scripture. Right? Jesus was the one who saw people's hearts and he contended for the weak. It is a characteristic of the Messiah's life in Isaiah chapter 11, and we see it clearly in the life of Jesus. So what else does Isaiah 11 say? The second half of verse 4 into verse 5, Isaiah tells us that the Messiah will be righteous. Right? Verse 5 says, righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness the sash around his waist. 
Scripture tells us that Jesus is righteous in all that he does. Do you ever wonder what Jesus' number one priority was? I know what he tells us to make our priority. All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All right, when Jesus goes to John to be baptized, John actually sees who he is and is like, look, I, I should not be baptizing you. That's right. uh, you should be the one baptizing me. I should not be the one doing this right now. But Jesus responds in, verse, in, in Matthew 3, 15. says, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Amen. All right, Jesus loves righteousness. He was motivated by righteousness. And it's not a stretch at all to say that Isaiah 11, talking about someone, about the Messiah being someone with righteousness as a belt and faithfulness as a sash, is talking about Jesus. Jesus fulfills this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 11. He'll be righteous. Lastly, Isaiah says that the new kingdom that the Messiah is ushering in and bringing with him is going to be a kingdom of peace. I mean, just listen to these, these last five verses, starting in verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will leave them, lead them. The cow will feed the bear, feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. And what an image we see here. All right, what an image is this? Enemies living together with no animosity. All right, there's no harm. There's no destruction. Just knowledge of the Lord. That's it. Right? It reminds me of Luke 2 again, this time before Jesus plays hooky early on in what we, what we actually like to call the Christmas story. Right, In Luke chapter 2, shepherds are in the fields, the angels appear to them. And in Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8, we read this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, when you get to the, the, you picture the Christmas story, I don't know about you, but peace is not necessarily the first thing that comes to my mind. Right? There's a teenage girl named Mary who finds out she's pregnant, and the baby is God's, and he's the Messiah. That's a tough one to explain, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Joseph doesn't even know what to do with it. We find out in the book of Matthew that we see that his initial response was just to, to call everything off. And we know that if, if he was having trouble processing it, you could imagine what everyone else was thinking. I think we all know what everyone else was thinking. All right, there's a long journey while pregnant across the country on a donkey. Does not sound peaceful to me. They pull into town. There's no place to stay. So they end up in a barn where they would have the baby. That doesn't seem peaceful. The king finds out what's happened, and he goes on a tirade. He actually kills all the boys under two years old. So maybe it's just me, but I put all that together, and it doesn't really sound like peace on earth. All right, and Christmas now doesn't tend to be all that peaceful either, does it? All right, our schedules are nuts. We just have, there's parties, there's work, there's decorating and they're shopping and it just seems to fill all of our time and while while none of those things is bad in fact a lot of them are really great things they can be really stressful all right it doesn't really seem like peace and if you're like me <clears throat> you've let this mindset take over at least one or two christmases where tell me if you've been here before you get so into the 
the doings that surround Christmas that you actually feel like you neglect what it's all about. And maybe one day, maybe it's even Christmas morning, you wake up and you realize that the season has come and gone without you even taking the time to stop and to think about why we celebrate in the first place. I remember a few years ago driving around during Christmas and just thinking, man, this doesn't even feel like Christmas right now. It just, uh, it just feels so busy. We're going to see family. We're going to do all this other stuff. There's, like, it just feels hectic and stressful. It doesn't feel like, you know, sometimes Christmas and peace just don't sound all that compatible. But Isaiah says that the Messiah will bring peace. So here's the question. Does Jesus bring peace? Jesus absolutely brings peace. Uh, and not just any peace either. I mean, you look at, uh, there's a time in John chapter 14, Jesus is comforting his disciples after telling them that he's, he's going to need to leave. He's telling them he's going to leave, the Holy Spirit's going to come. But here's, here's what he says. He's, he says in, in uh, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. So whose peace? He's giving it his peace. That's that same peace that Philippians chapter 4 tells us transcends all understanding. That's the kind of peace that Jesus brings. And go back with me. What is he bringing this peace into? He's bringing it into a world of brokenness and darkness and fearful gloom. Right? Isaiah chapter 8 puts it that way. And as I said before, Advent isn't just about, about looking back and just remembering uh, the coming of Christ. It's also about looking forward with the same anticipation and expectation for the second coming of Christ, because we have a promise in Scripture that he's going to come again. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there are a lot of people who put a lot of time and a lot of energy into trying to figure out when that's going to happen. <laughs> Personally, here's what I think. I don't think it matters. Here's, here's what we say. Be ready. Amen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when, when he's coming. Right, but just like those people in Isaiah, Isaiah 11 could look forward to the coming of Christ with this, this image of peace in their minds, I think we can do the same thing. All right, those images that we see, that's peace, the, lying, the lion laying with the sheep. Right, Martin Luther famously said, if the lion lays down with a lamb these days, you have to keep replacing the lamb. <clears throat> but not so in the kingdom to come, right? It's going to be a kingdom of peace. And again, verse 9, it says, they will neither harm... <clears throat> nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. And doesn't that make you just long for the coming of the Messiah? Come on, doesn't that make you just long for it? Isaiah, 800 years before the birth of Jesus, said that the Messiah would be one who comes from the stump of Jesse, that he would have the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel and might and knowledge and fear of the Lord that he wouldn't make judgments by appearance or hearsay, but based on the heart and his righteousness. And we see all of Isaiah 11 in Jesus Christ. We see all that in Jesus. And, and in this Advent, we celebrate that the light of the world has come, right? that, that Jesus has already come, but we also look forward to another coming. Yep. We look forward with the same anticipation, the same expectation. We look forward with hope, and we look forward with a peace that passes all understanding. All right, you look at Isaiah, and Jesus is all over the pages. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the second coming of the Messiah, whose name is still Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we love you this morning. And we are so grateful that, uh, that you came. Yeah. We're grateful that you sent your son. We're grateful that Jesus came, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who saves us from our sins, and he is the one who came to, to live the life that you called him to live. God, I just pray that this week that we would, we would go forward and we would think about the peace that the coming of the Messiah will bring. And we look back at Jesus and we see the peace that he did bring. He even says, it's your peace. It's not, it's not just any peace. It is the peace is your peace, God. We know it's the peace that passes all understanding. That is the peace that Jesus brings, God. I just pray that we would, we would live into that peace this week. 
that we would look for it because it's there. And even in the, the, the hectic reality that sometimes Christmas brings us, God, I just pray that we would lean into your peace. God, I pray that as we go forward that you would go with us, that you would go ahead of us, that you'd be with us in our workplaces, in our homes, in our conversations, that you would speak through us, that you would move through us, that the people that look at us would see you and see the peace that you bring us. And God, would it cause them to, to ask and to seek you. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.